today's webinar. I'm Katie Green. I lead our content here at Current Health, and I will be your guide through today's discussion. Um, you have a, a little roll call question up there to give us a sense of who is with us in the room today. Would love to see your vote. We're going to pull that up in a second. A couple quick things for housekeeping. I apologize if you showed up ready to um, show your beautiful face on camera, um, as I thought we'd be able to do that and we aren't. However, you will have the ability to um, unmute yourself um, for our several question and answer sessions throughout this, um, this webinar. So we'll have a couple of points for reaction, but give us a heads up in the Q&A box if you would like to ask a question, that way we are prepared for you. And then because I know we're going to get uh, this question in the chat, this is being recorded and you will get both the recording and the deck um, in an email follow up tomorrow. Here we go. Here's a look at what um, is on deck for today's discussion. First, we're going to unpack the results from our State of Care at Home survey. I'm excited to have Chris and Dan offering some reflections on that data. And then um, we will have our dispatch from the Hill. Uh, Jeremiah McCoy, um, our policy expert, is going to give us a look at some inside baseball and what happens next for the um, policy landscape for care at home. And as I understand it, things are moving very quickly. We have got some fresh uh, updates from today, actually. And then last but certainly not least, um, we will have a really enlightening customer spotlight um, about NYU Langone's Home Hospital uh, program. We're excited to have Eve Dorfman with us for that. A quick um, rundown of our speakers, but before we get to them, who are you? Um, I hope you guys can see the results of this little survey on your um, on your screen. I'm excited to see strong representation across everybody, especially that IT group coming in really strong. Welcome, whoever you are. I'm glad that you're here. Um, our panel of experts today, we'll start with uh, Christopher McCann, our CEO and co-founder of Current Health. Chris started Current Health in 2015 as a medical student, leaving uh, with the belief that technology could have a more profound impact on how care is delivered at scale. Since then, Chris has led the company through many major milestones, including our acquisition by Best Buy in October of last year. Today, Chris sits on the Best Buy Health Leadership Team, helping to develop our care at home strategy while also leading operations for the current health business. Welcome, Chris. Glad to have you here today. Joining Chris for our first um, section of survey uh, data reactions will be Dan DeRazio. Uh, Dan is the CEO of Sage Growth Partners, where he uh, shapes and leads the vision for the firm, um, really focused on helping clients to accelerate their commercial growth. Dan's career includes extensive experience in value creation, strategic advisory, marketing, and project launches for nonprofit and public sectors, as well as the corporate world. Um, Dan has worked extensively with all players in the healthcare industry, um, from service providers, technology advice companies, payers, um, provider orgs, and we're really excited to have his perspective on today's webinar as well. Next up, Jeremiah McCoy. Jeremiah is the Senior Director of Government Affairs and Policy for Serona Strategies, where he focuses on the um, policy and regulatory analysis, public affairs, and strategy related to home-based care, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and care. Jeremiah manages the day-to-day -day operations, lobbying, and policy efforts of Moving Health Home, which is an awesome coalition of nearly 30 leading healthcare companies advocating for the home to be a clinical care. Health is very proud to be one of those member companies. And Eve, Eve Dorfman, the Vice President of Operations for NYU Langone, um, many diverse roles in nursing and leadership throughout her career. In her current role, she oversees home health services, dialysis services, respiratory therapy, hospital medicine services, and biomedical engineering. In the past year, she successfully led the charge to operationalize a home hospital program for NYU Langone Hospitals. So as you can see, we've got just phenomenal expertise gathered today. Welcome to um, all of our experts. Just thank you for sharing your, your insights and perspective with us today. One more final piece of introduction um, for those who may be around here. I want to provide a look at who is. Do you know where we're from? Um, we are really the market leading platform for technology enabled care at home. Out in the wild, this looks like enabling programs up and down the acuity spectrum from that acute hospital at home model that we've taken 
under that CMS waiver, um, down to chronic condition management and really helping complex uh, patients manage their diseases and stay out of the hospital. Um, this uh, is a look at some of our sample customers. We're really proud to, to partner with um, for all of these programs. And a high level look at our platform kind of in a nutshell, um, it is an interoperable platform for that care at home, combining remote patient monitoring, integrated telehealth, patient engagement tools, um, wraparound support services, and then guidance um, and, uh, and expertise to help you operationalize and, um, and see success from care at home programs. And with that, we will jump into some of our survey results. Uh, you may have seen or may have not seen. Uh, so far today, we released our on the 2022 State of Care at Home. Um, this was a survey that we um, partnered with Sage Growth Partners to um, execute. And we talked to uh, more than 100 um, hospital and health system leaders, primarily in the C-suite. Um, to see what they were thinking about care at home um, and how they were uh, how they were shaping their plans and expectations and what challenges they're facing um, with moving care into that setting. So to kind of level set, it should um, I'm sure it comes as no surprise here that uh, health systems are facing a really difficult environment right now. Um, and I know that this uh, this ranking is probably um, probably not a huge surprise, but the near universality of, of staffing coming in as that number one pain point on health system leaders minds. Um, I'm gonna turn it over uh, first to, to Chris. What what stands out to you about the, the sort of environment that health system leaders are navigating right now? I, I mean, I think the first thing is that this really validated what we hear from our partners um, every single day, and particularly the, the labor challenges that they face. I, I think what we are seeing at the moment is two different types of approach in this space. There are those who are facing capacity problems and who are uh, seeking actively to try and move more care into the home because they have to. That is a way of creating that capacity and reducing those bottlenecks. And then there's those who maybe do or don't have capacity issues but are facing um, really significant financial issues, partly driven by some of the problems here, lower revenue, it, it looks like overall utilization is down post COVID and it appears that is sustained after COVID uh, coupled with, you know, simultaneously massive increase in, in delivery costs, particularly around labor. And I think for that group, especially if they don't have capacity problems, the natural instinct is to focus on the core business, which is heads and beds and particularly those service lines that are more revenue generative, like surgery. I think what we're seeing in that group though, is some come forward and say, Hey, we recognize that the future isn't just going to be this way, that we're going to have to innovate and we're going to have to deliver care differently. And some consumers are going to start choosing um, where they get healthcare based on availability of those services. And I think those organizations that are innovative are embracing that and trying to do things differently. I do think it is a very, very, very difficult year to be a hospital and provider of healthcare. Certainly. Dan, how's this stack up to what else you're hearing out there? I I think to your point, Katie, no surprises, but what I'm looking for are some of the connection points. So if we look at the staffing shortages, what we're talking about is the, the people who provide those services. And if you go down to then the provider experience and then adapting to new norms of care delivery, you sort of have the staff, the, the physicians and the clinicians and the consumer all tied into this equation. And I think it's overwhelming to think about how you can uh, operate a new model of care, like care at home or hospital at home. But I think the irony is that if you don't, these other problems are going to get more difficult. So I, I think uh, we have a lot of clients that operate ASCs. And what they're telling us is that um, from a staffing perspective, they're not having problems uh, finding opportunities for their team because what's good for the staff is good for the consumer. And that's what I want people to really start to think about. We constantly talk about the consumer, but care for the caregiver uh, is also what's good for the consumer, right? So 
I can um, get my procedures done on time. I have a predictable schedule. Um, we're always going to need nurses in the acute care setting, but I think it's it's known that a lot of those folks leave those positions one, three, four, five years. And so I think as an organization, you could offer a, a more competitive um, sort of job and career ladder as you look to these innovative models. And it's, I'm sure we hear this from our, uh, we talk to folks in, in healthcare all the time, it's overwhelming, but there might not be a better time to start this because there has been a lot of innovation that came from COVID and there's energy around this. And so I think if you look at any of these by themselves, um, you can get overwhelmed. I think if you look at them in a connected fashion, you're gonna find threads that go through these. Um, and, and by the way, reduced revenue is not going away. It's gonna push to an ASC. It moved, went from you know hospital, hospital outpatient department, ASCs, post-acute, ambulatory home. We know where this is headed. It's already happening and it's already in front of us. So I think from a human capital perspective, moving and allowing some of those options can be innovative, even in small steps. And that's um, as difficult as this is, that's what I see here as opportunity. And I think we're gonna hear today from Eve about what you know what's possible. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a great point. These are not, these are not individual problems. They are in every way enmeshed in one another. Um, so I'm going to keep us rolling here. We also asked about, you know, what is what is the current um, current adoption of these programs? What is your experience with these different types of care at home? And and Rachel's going to get a poll on um, on our audience here too, as as well with your experience with care at home. Um, but but we see here that you know two thirds self reported some type of um, you know healthcare service that their patients can access from home available today. Um, but what I what I really wanted to ask uh, ask you about Chris and and Dan is you know these these plans for expansion like what do you make of of kind of where these landed and and um, where health health system and hospital leaders are seeing the opportunity for these new care models? Yeah, I mean I think firstly. I think, again, it shows how broadly people define care at home. Um, you know, the telehealth visit for a specialist is being grouped here as, as care at home along with something like hospital at home. But these are, you know, wildly different, wildly, wildly different um, programs. I, I think our, certainly our vision as an organization has been how do we help health systems deliver care at home up and down the acuity ladder. So all the way from um, someone who just needs those individual touch points on a you know monthly or annual basis, all the way down to um, much higher acuity hospital at home. And I, I think what we're starting to see is the health systems think about it that way and, and starting to invest in all these different um all these different service lines. I think the least surprising thing was was the low penetration of the hospital at home space. I think that comes down to the lack of durability of the financial model. And Jeremiah is going to give us a, an update on that. But I think it's, it's the least surprising that most people are still hesitating as to whether to go forward with that, given the investment it represents, given the lack of durable financial model. And I think that financial model also plays into whether health systems embrace post-acute and chronic care management, the, the financial model during COVID for telehealth visits has been really pretty strong, still really, really weak for post-acute and chronic care management. And while that financial model doesn't really help drive this, we're, we're still going to see, um, we're still going to see these organizations hold back from, from really doing it. And that's where the change needs to come. It needs to come in the payment models for this. You know, when I, uh, I I think about how how important our um, our provider infrastructure is, it, it's hard not to worry about this as you know someone who's in healthcare and all of us that depend on it. And what I what I've been thinking a lot about lately is we've we've always used this term safety net hospitals. I fear that hospitals can become and might become already be the safety net if they don't start to think differently about who shows up at their front door. We know through COVID, there's been a massive delay in care, a lot of misdiagnosis. And when you look at reports, uh, we know hospital patient stays are longer, they're sicker. 
uh, revenue is not going to go up. I think it's going to be increasingly difficult in those environments. And so I think there's a lot of value in this continuum of providing care outside of the traditional walls. And we use this term value-based care all the time. I would just encourage us to think about, well, what is the value of each of these different modalities? And it could be about revenue. It could be about cost. It could be about operating model. It could be around staff recruitment and retention. It could be about um, a better you know, post-acute network provider. I think there's many strategic reasons for using these different models. So I, again, I think it's early enough to get on the front end of this to, to really embrace this move. No one, well, I shouldn't say no one. I doubt that anyone got this figured out. In fact, Eve, when we were talking, you know, you continue to tweak your program. So I think we're all in this situation together. We're all in this sort of, we need this to work between the continuum of care. And each of these different opportunities provides a different level of value. So getting on the front end of it, I think is really important. And, and I don't think you have to jump, you know, right to one program. And I also know that, it is a different delivery model. It is a different operating model. And we shouldn't just think about this like, hey, I could take my same team, my same staff, my same model and apply it to a different sort of site of care. I, I think it requires the honesty and the sobriety of looking at this opportunity for what it is. And it might feel different in terms of then what you can deliver. Yeah, absolutely. That that change management piece of you can't just relocate all of the processes that are existing in your in your bricks and mortar care delivery system and just move them into the home like that. It's not going to work. Um, and it's a it's a it's a great way to ruin your adoption. But doing that work up front of figuring out like Eve's team has done, what are the workflows? What what is the next step that actually needs to happen for this patient, for this provider? And then designing that whole experience around that. Um, it's a it's a big job, but do it now or do it later. <laughs> All right, absolutely. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, we also asked our, our survey audience here, you know, what do you see as the benefits to care at home? What are, what are the things that are rising to the top of your, um, of your awareness in terms of what is useful about these, these new care models? Um, and you know, the, the top four that we got there are, are all clinical. Um, which I think is is interesting. Um, Dan, you had some you had some thoughts about you know the kind of the distribution here of clinical versus more of those operational um, and the and our low ranking uh, benefits on the staffing question coming in. Yeah, right, absolutely. So my the first thing I looked at here, and this is um, you know a little bit tongue in cheek, but again, I take this in the spirit. I think everyone has a hospital at home called the readmissions challenge. And if you're not doing something differently to try to address that, we know where those folks come back. They come back to the ED and they're penalized and the transitions of care are difficult. So I think I'd encourage you to say, we have to think differently because we know it's been very stubborn to move readmissions over the course of time. Patient behavior and adherence is very difficult. Things like medication adherence. I think the visibility into the home, both you know, with um, visually speaking, but being in person is powerful. I remember hearing in the early days of COVID, people were actually getting um, a window into people's life uh, virtually, but also if you're there physically, there's so much that you can see that's happening. And we know that when patients um, leave their provider, they, they forget 85% of what they're told and health literacy is really difficult in this country. And so if, if we can't connect the dots between where they've been treated in a hospital and then where they're going, we should not be surprised that we're not moving the needle if we're not doing something different from a readmissions perspective. So I want this to stick in your head. We have a hospital at home or care at home program. If we don't, it's called ED patients that are showing up that shouldn't be here. And, and I think that's the clarion call. And on the staffing issue, again, I think the disconnect is, well, I can't get enough staff here. Um, how am I gonna find them for the at-home program? A lot of our partners are having no difficulty finding people who can do care management and care utilization and remote management. And they're excited about being able to, to, to maybe even practice more of the care that they want to and have a deeper relationship. So it, it, it's tough to think about how you can pivot that, but. I think there's, um, you know, 
joy on the other side of this, even though there's a lot to overcome. And again, I think you're on the right side of the timing of this to get started from even an approach perspective. Yeah. Chris, what would you add to that? I, I completely agree with what Dan said. I, I think that the, um, you know, I, I think that if you ask all 103 people, if they think more care will be delivered at home within five or 10 years, I think you'll get a hundred percent yes. And I think the benefits that are being identified here, I don't think are surprising. I think there's two challenges for the majority of our partners, which is the, the, the first one being in a fee for service world, which is what most of us still live in. Um, benefit two and benefit three here are, are largely not positive things for hospitals. In fact, partly that's what's causing some of the, the financial turbulence that's, mm. that's affecting them right now. So the, there's, again, to talk about this payment model innovation and reform and a shift to a world where money follows the patient rather than follows the, the silos where they're receiving care. And where we as a, a vendor work with our partners to understand how we can create financial models that do incentivize more care in the home, I think is, is really, really important. And I, I think one of the things that's been missing in the care at home space, although Jeremiah has been doing amazing work within his organization to move this forward, is enough discussion about payment models. I think clinically it makes absolute sense. Of course, we should be doing more care in the home. The payment models are still lagging behind. The second thing I think is that the operational challenge of actually delivering care in the home is, is really, really high. Um, yeah, I was with a partner the other day and they used an example that to admit a patient to the floor takes one click. To put them home takes six phone calls. And that wasn't an exaggeration. We need that level of operational simplicity and ease around putting someone into the home versus putting them on the floor or people just won't do it. There's loads of things we can do on a day-to-day -day basis that improve clinical care, and we don't do them because there just isn't enough time in the day. There's other priorities, you know, that, that are operationally too complicated, whatever. Like, we need to make it operationally really easy and financially viable. Yeah, Chris, just to add really quick, this notion about improving value-based care performance, I, I think the definition of value-based care is still debated. You can ask uh, a, a, one person to get a different answer. I'd like you to think about this. Um, you know, in the hospital world, DH, DRGs are capitated, right? And the, the revenue is going to continue to go down. Penalties are going to continue to increase. In essence, the world you operate in is, is driven by value and capitation at some level. If you can move patients out of your facility sooner, um, you know, we know that the last few days are, are – um, less expensive. So maybe it's not a huge financial benefit up front, but reducing the complexity on your staff and the tension and the friction within the operations of the organization, which is already incredibly difficult. I think there's, again, different levels of value that we can ascribe. Um, and think about yourself in value-based care already. Of course, Medicare is pushing it. That's a great point, Dan. Before we get too far away from our previous um, uh, poll question there, Rachel, what does the experience of our audience look like? Um, okay, interesting. Half coming in at live with at least one programmer use case. We see you customers, welcome. Um, <laughs> and then 10% in the, or 11 in the process of implementing a program. Um, I think uh, Eve's insights are gonna be really helpful for you. Another 27 actively, uh, planning or designing, and then um, a third, um, considering or exploring. Awesome. That's so interesting to see. And then I think Rachel's going to go ahead and push our last poll question um, of the session. Thank you for bearing with me um, as we uh, ask about your take on, you know, benefits in your organization. Um, as we uh, wait for that to, to come in, um, wanted to uh, shift gears a little bit into, you know, what do uh, health system Chris, do you do you have you have your hand raised? Sorry. Oh, <laughs> like you can jump in. Um, I don't know how I did that. <laughs> um, ask to, ask the leaders who reported that they do have some type of care at home service live today. You know what is what is hard and um, what are the most challenging things about doing that? As we know, there's there are plenty of challenges in relocating that care. Um, once again, we we do see workforce you know rising to the top there again. Uh, Chris, why don't you um, kick us off with what stands out to you about about the data on this one? 
I, again, I, I actually I thought it was super validating for what we've um what we've seen. I, I think the number one concern that every single one of our partners and prospective partners has had about launching Care at Home is can they get the right workforce? Um and Dan said this already, but I think we need to start thinking in this space actually that Care at Home can be a way a way of re-engaging and retaining staff. Um we have partners where they have brought in RNs and physicians who were burnt out, who were disengaged, who didn't feel they were really delivering clinical care anymore, who have now turned around and said that within care at home, they're delivering the care they have wanted to for their entire career. In hospital at home, they're able to go in and spend an hour with the patient in the home, deeply understanding their lived experience and really holistically assessing them. Whereas on the floor, they're getting paged every two minutes. They've got eight patients they need to go and see, um, and they don't feel they're getting to deliver that, that care. So I think there is a real opportunity to use care at home as a way of re-engaging and retaining our incredible clinicians and physicians. But I don't think we get that for free. Um, I think that we get that by better defining the role of the home hospitalist and the RN that's in Healthcare at home, I, I don't think it's the same as traditional home care. I think it's a different thing. Um, and I also think we have to look at the training and accreditation and education requirements for those specialties as well. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity there. The, the second thing I'll say, and, I, and then I'll pass over to Dan, is that the you know in-home support for patients, I was really pleased to see that because candidly, that was a reason why we chose to join with Best Buy. We felt that there were a whole bunch of patients and consumers out there who needed extra help with technology in the home if they were going to be part of these programs. We thought Best Buy was world class at that through Geek Squad. And, you know, these are the patients who, in my opinion, we can most move the needle on on cost and outcomes. The patients who need that extra bit of support, we believe are the ones where they will suffer the most out, uh, poorest outcomes. They will eventually cost the most money. So that is exactly what we're trying to do with um with Geek Squad, it's a really important priority for us that we provide equitable outcomes that we get to patients who otherwise would be excluded. Half of our patients don't have internet, a fifth don't have smartphones. Um, and I think this third column on support really speaks to that experience across um, everyone who responded. Yeah, Dan? Yeah, really quickly here, back on the staffing component. Um, we have partners who um, like current health that are their workforces in the field. And I would like, um, and I hear this from the board meetings, we have to support and surround this workforce differently. And I, I call it sort of the social determinants of work. Um, these are folks who are out in the community and seeing, um, you know, seeing the patients. They are the representation of your brand. And they love to carry that brand. So let's think about how we, you know, think not just about, oh, I've got to hire someone. I need to fill a spot. Yeah, I think there is a, a, a group of folks that are going to raise their hand and we can wrap that support around them, just like they'll wrap their support around the patients. We know from data, happy nurse, happy patient, right? And, and we know that connection is really important. So if we put the right support around our staff, who I think they're there, then I think that goes a long way. And when you're in the home, you can see a lot, right? Literally see a lot uh, that you don't see on a unit. So I, I think that's what's encouraging. Absolutely. Um, Rachel, let's let's take a peek at, uh, at what our audience liked as the most important benefits for their org. Okay, reduce cost. Of, I, this is actually how I expected it to go. Um, yeah, when we when we have a group here talking about thinking about what does it mean for these care models to to succeed, reduce cost or revenue growth. Um, cool, and then and then outcomes and patient experiences um, coming in there again. Very low uh, reporting on the importance of staffing or provider experiences. I think we've got um, we've got some educating to do about the potential there, as Eve is going to kind of share with us. I um, want to breeze through this one pretty quickly as we are starting to get um, a little bit tight on time. Um, I, I think what we're seeing here is, is just really consistent, um, you know, importance of designing an excellent patient experience and an excellent provider experience. And that's really what that importance of EHR integration is about, right? Um, Chris, do you want to kind of sum up what, um, what stands out to you on this and like 
10 seconds. I think it's what I said earlier. If it takes six phone calls to put someone in hospital home versus one click, we're going to put them on the floor. So we have to make it easier, not just as easy, easier to put them in hospital home. And that speaks to the prioritization of some of these points um, on the on the chart. Right. Design those operational incentives. All right. Um, we're going to transition to policy, but real quick, we do have a question in the chat from Joe. Joe, do you can you unmute yourself and, and pop this question uh, in front of our panelists real quick? We're, we're experimenting live here. Joe, do you have that ability? Let me see if I can find you. How about now? We got you. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the discussion was about the, the, the staff in the community and perhaps the ability to um, increase staffing with this role of more community and not just inpatient hospital care. I guess the question is, um, is that most often done or the folks on the phone today, are they, are you able to hire um, staff with this new role that they may fill? Or are you using partners who already have nurses, therapists, you know, respiratory in the field, i.e. Um, home health providers? Do you want me to take this? That would yeah, be amazing, Eve, please. Yeah. So um, thanks for that question. It's a good question. Um, you know, staffing keeps coming up as, as everyone has spoken about so far. So I can tell you from our experience at NYU that we have um, not partnered with um, others to provide the care at home. We are doing that with NYU employees, and we have had no trouble staffing the home hospital. I'm going to get into that in a little while in more detail about the why. And it, it really echoes um, some of what Chris and Dan has said. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Sorry, I'm going to keep us moving because I want Jeremiah to be able to give us his um, up to the minute updates from Washington, DC. Jeremiah. Thanks, and I'll try to be quick so we can leave plenty of time for Eve as well, because I, I know we're all excited to hear the boots on the ground perspective too. Um, I think I'll start with just giving a kind of state, the, state of play not related to care in the home, right? Because I'd be doing a, a disservice to talk about all our policy priorities without kind of setting the stage and context of how things kind of stand in, in D.C. because they're all kind of interrelated. But I think it should come at, at, at no surprise to anyone. I hope that we're coming out of an election cycle, uh, which is uh, changing the, the makeup of the next Congress, the 118th Congress. So at the highest level, right, we saw the House flip to the Republicans. Um, Democrats are keeping the Senate with one additional seat, um, and that's notable because we, we had previously been a 50-50 split. So now um, we were operating under, a, or I guess previously operating under a power sharing agreement, which meant Democrats didn't really have full control over committees. Now that that's going to be 51-50, Democrats will actually have full control over committees, so that's notable. But the, obviously the notable piece here is that we have gridlock, you know, we have uh, Republicans on one side, Democrats on the other in terms of a divided government. Um, and that means that bipartisanship is, is going to have to win if we want to accomplish goals. On kind of where things stand uh, in what we call the lame duck session that we're in right now, um, where we obviously are coming out of an election, but the new Congress hasn't started. So there are, you know, members of Congress that lost elections that are, are, are currently in, in Congress still. And we're at a really critical spot right now because there's a lot of interest from members of Congress to accomplish their priorities before the session ends uh, and the new session starts uh, next month on January 3rd. Um, and we also have a, a must pass legislative vehicle, which is relevant to us because it means that there are opportunities to latch on uh, policy objectives like uh, the extension of the acute care home um, waiver, which I'll talk about. Um, but right now, government funding um, ends on the 16th. So that means Congress has to either pass the CR, uh, a continuing resolution, which continues funding uh, for a short term or pass a large term omnibus. Um, what we know now is that uh, either tomorrow or on Thursday, Congress is gonna um, put uh, or put to the floor a, a week long extension for, for government funding. So just continuing government funding at current rates until December, 23rd. 
And what that means is that both sides of the aisle are committed to a larger omnibus package. So a comprehensive funding package that can include a bunch of different policy riders, which is notable for us because we're trying to get the acute care at home as part of that omnibus. And it's looking optimistic that it will be. Um, but again, negotiations are are still, you know, moving forward and we don't have a lot of insight into, you know, text and even top line figures yet. So there's a lot to still figure out. I think the one thing I want to just quickly note is that there's a lot of healthcare related priorities that folks want in this end of year package. So I'm, I'm sure folks have heard if, if you're in the physician, you know, arena, there are issues with physician payment that need to be addressed. There are some value based care uh, expiring MIPS provisions that that folks want to get extended, telehealth, you know, home health, uh, hospital home, of course. Um, and then just to say, obviously, our main priority is the acute care uh, at home uh, waiver, which I'll talk about. But if you want to go to the next slide, I'll, I'll just quickly go over kind of where things stand. In terms of priorities that we're uh, pushing for, what we're seeing uh, as an end of year priority, we have hospital home obviously is the biggest priority for us. We're getting, we're trying to get a two year extension of that acute hospital care home waiver. Uh, things are looking very optimistic that that's gonna happen if, if there is an omnibus. Um, the other obviously is telehealth, huge, huge efforts there to try to get an extension of a lot of the telehealth provisions that we've seen during the pandemic. There is a school of thought that uh, that hospital home should ride along with telehealth uh, because obviously, you know, they're often taken together, right? Without telehealth and some of the flexibilities there, it's harder for a hospital home program to operate. So there is a kind of conventional thinking that those two things need to ride together. Uh, from what we hear, it sounds like telehealth is likely going to be in the omnibus too, but instead of a two-year, it likely be a one-year extension. But telehealth has already gotten an 151 day extension post public health emergency. So they already have um, uh, some, some extension. So this additional year would be on top of that 151 days. And then the last I'll just mention is, you know, home health is also important. And, and you know, there's been some cuts that, that folks are trying to move forward with. On the acute care at home waiver that I know you guys all care a lot about. Um, I'm sure you know that we have bipartisan, bicameral, you know, legislation that's been introduced um, that we're, we're trying to pass in an omnibus package. I think the biggest update for you all is that the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan agency that essentially tells Congress what uh, a policy is going to cost, has told committees of jurisdiction that it won't cost the federal government any, any money, so it'll be, it'll be budget neutral. Uh, which was a huge uh, win to actually get us at the table to get this uh, legislation considered for an end of your package. Um, you know, if things cost, they need offsets and those offsets are, are hard to find. So this has really significantly changed the game for us. Um, I will say we obviously do have until uh, April of next year, technically to get an extension because it's tied to the public health emergency. And the public health emergency is likely to be extended at least to April of next year. Um, so we technically have time, but we're trying to tell the story that you know providers and patients need predictability and sustainability in that regulatory environment to try to get it done end of year um, so we can keep that momentum up. Um, the one thing I just want to mention on, on conversations, because it's relevant here, I think over time the conversations on the Hill have fundamentally shifted, right? We we started talking about just what hospital home it was, like. Most health staff only knew home health and didn't even know hospital home was, was possible. Then we started to move into you know, questions about quality and outcomes and costs and all the more weedy questions. And I think the relevant piece here is that we've moved beyond that. And now we're talking about how to get this over the finish line. So you know, we're having conversations about implementation dollars and how to get it implemented and you know, what needs to happen to make sure it's an end of your package. I think that's most notable, right? Those conversations have fundamentally shifted from what is hospital at home to how do we get it done? Um, uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. And I'll just briefly say on this one, uh, we don't need to go into detail. Uh, the one thing I'll say is obviously we have third, great support for in terms of participation, right? Approaching 300 hospitals. That's a really good story to tell on the Hill. And then also having at least one hospital in 37 states is huge to take to the Hill especially when you're talking with, you know, senators and representatives from that state uh, or a district to say, hey, you have a hospital in your state or district that's participating. 
that's been a huge uh, uh, fundamental shift in, in getting more support for the waiver extension. The one thing I want to mention in terms of what we're thinking about uh, next Congress, right? This is a, a moving out home bill that we're working on. It's called the Expanding Care in the Home Act. Uh, we're we're going to try to get it introduced uh, Q1 of next Congress, but just want to kind of illuminate it as a as a as setting the priority for for next Congress, right? This is uh, what we're thinking of as a messaging bill to say, hey, if Congress wants to move the needle on care in the home. Here are all the barriers that exist in Medicare today. So not as focused on acute care at home, but looking at all those other models that exist that you know have a have a component to home based care. So you know, looking at primary care and how to make that more efficient and, and, and feasible from a from a payment perspective. You know, same thing with home infusion and in home labs. Uh, you know, workforce. I mean, you guys have talked a lot about workforce. We're trying to think about how we can better stand up a home based care workforce to better you know, support the movement of the industry and where things are headed, which is the home. So making sure that we have higher skilled workforces that are prepared to enter the home and, and take that into consideration. Same thing with the EMT workforce, right? We, we understand that's an underutilized workforce and they you know, have a lot of aspects that they can you know, accomplish in terms of at-home care and trying to better utilize that workforce as well. So look out for that next Congress. I think to end, I, you know, obviously I hit on some of these themes, um, you know, gridlock, Again, means bipartisan agreement. Luckily, home-based care has been bipartisan to this point. Still a lot of uncertainty on, on, on key committee leadership, uh, you know, waiting to see where things fall. You know, depending on the, the member of Congress that's on that committee spot will determine what the priorities are. Um, and priorities will shift as, as legislative vehicles, you know, move. We're gonna be looking for, you know, bipartisan legislative vehicles in the new Congress. There's been a lot of talk about you know mental health and Medicare Advantage by Roth and addressing chronic conditions. So I think there are going to be opportunities to advance a lot of care and home priorities. Um, but again, ideally, we're going to get the hospital at home uh, waiver extended in, in the next couple of weeks before the end of the year. But if not, it'll be a huge priority at the beginning of the 118th Congress to get that over the finish line too. And the last thing I'll just end on is we're fully expecting home-based care to be the focus of next Congress. We're going to make it that way. Um, we're going to do a lot of, you know, conditioning and education to make sure that leadership and members of Congress are talking about care in the home uh, and prioritizing it. So look out for the 118th Congress and the focus of care in the home. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremiah. Great work. Everybody ask Santa to bring hospital at home for yeah. Christmas. <laughs> 23rd. Yes. <laughs> All right. If you have questions for Jeremiah, please go ahead and throw those in the in the box and we'll try to get to them at the end here. I um, am going to go ahead and shift it over to Eve, um, who has graciously waited for the most anticipated section of this uh, webinar. Um, Eve really spearheaded the, the whole team and, and program design at NYU Langone um, and has some awesome, uh, awesome lessons learned to, to take us through today. So Eve, over to you. Thanks so much, Katie. Really appreciate um, the intro here. Um, so I will tell you, I just want to start off by saying that um, everyone is talking about what a big lift this is, and it is a big lift, but it is doable. Okay, so there's a lot of lessons that we've learned over the past year. My um, CEO came to me over a year ago, probably a year and a half at this point, and said, here's our problem let's figure out a solution. And our intervention was implementing a home hospital to deal with that problem, okay? Our problem happened to be capacity. We have no room. Our length of stay is down. Our um, discharge time is down. And yet our, our, our capacity or occupancy remains extremely high and puts us in gridlock. And we were having um, problems with healthcare access for our patients. So the first thing I'm going to really focus on and real, uh, the point I want uh, to hit home here is you have to understand the why behind what you're doing. Because this is such a, um, it's so complex, these programs, um, it will help drive your decision making. And so when you have your why and ours was capacity, build that into your mission and create a mission for your program and let that mission guide you along the way. Um, and you will find that, that that will serve you well. Um, next step is you need executive buy-in. Without executive buy-in, it will be virtually impossible. 
to do this. Um, care in the hospital is com complex enough. When you try and then shift that care to a, the home population, um, it becomes even more logistically complex. And so it you really have to touch every single department within the hospital and leverage their expertise in order to make this successful. In order to do that, you need executive buy-in because there are a ton of competing priorities at all of our hospitals. Um, so in order to get that kind of buy-in from all the other departments, it's really important to have that executive buy-in. The third point is put interoperability at the core. I can't stress this enough. If the, and, and Chris, you, you, you talked about this so beautifully at the beginning. If it's not easy, it's not going to work. We are challenging physicians, nurses, clinicians, patients, families to think about care differently. If it's not easy, or if it's more difficult, we're not gonna, you're not gonna get the buy-in. You're just not. So making sure that we have, so for instance, at NYU, we've really integrated current health and, and Epic really nicely. So if you're a clinician, you have one-stop shopping. There's one place you go to find that comprehensive health record and find all of the information you need right there. So that's just been tremendous for us. And lastly, again, design, design a simple experience for patients of all education levels, all technological savviness. Um, you know, we have to be able to make it really easy for the patient to interact with this care delivery model or because otherwise it will just be easier for them to be in the hospital and they're not going to want to participate in programs like this. We can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about who we are real quick. We're a 591-bed academic medical center. Uh, we're about 20 miles east of Manhattan. We're level one trauma. We're five-star ranked from CMS and LeapFrog and Joint Commission and all that good stuff. So quality is at our core. Um, it really is. Uh, we have about 35,000 patient discharges in 2021, um, births, ED visits. We have a very busy ED. It's about 70,000 visits at this point and about 7,000 inpatient surgeries. Um, so we are in a health system. We're one of three academic medical centers within this health system, um, but we are the only one, current one currently um, providing this service at this time. Although the, 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 uh, the goal is to scale. Next slide. So before you really um, start the planning, a core piece of the planning is going to be to do an environmental context, to really understand what your environment is. You need to, so we already discussed the why, okay? You need to be able to identify all your stakeholders, and we're going to talk about who some of those people are, um, and, and create a project charter for this type of program and really dig deep. Now, these are some of the, this is a SWOT analysis for, for our campus. This, I'm not gonna go through each one, but what this does is it really laid out our top priorities in terms of strengths and opportunities and weaknesses and threats. So we could um, anticipate where we were going to have to concentrate a, a lot of our efforts. And it really, really was helpful in creating that roadmap so, and lessen the surprises or the unexpected barriers that were going to occur when we um, rolled out this innovative care delivery model. So really take a look at your environment, take a look at what your um, weaknesses are, are you, do you have a physician group that is really, you know that they're never going to buy into that? Okay, so that's a threat or a weakness, right? So you want to be able to address that and plan on address it way before you go live. So th this is, again, it is really helpful in creating that roadmap for program implementation. Next slide. So uh, who we had at the table. So NYU chose to uh, home grow this program. And, and, and candidly, the only 
um, vendors that we do use for our home hospital program are for mobile radiology, because we don't do mobile radiology, although our radiologists are reading those scans, um, and oxygen, so DME equipment, and then that's really it. Oh, uh, we're using uh, emergency ambulance ambulance services for transportation. But other than that, everything is um, from NYU itself. Pharmacy is from NYU. Um, everything else is from NYU. So it's important to really understand every department that is key in 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 you know, creating a program like this. So we created our subject matter expert team and those were consistent members. Um, you need not only acute care um, subject matter experts as well as outpatient mm -hmm. subject matter experts. We're very fortunate that we do have a certified home health agency at NYU. So we really had mm -hmm. some awesome experts that help guide us um, what uh, care at home looks like and what the, um, different nuances were would be and, and how to and, and, uh, plan for that in the, in the future. Uh, we had people from the ED, inpatient, radiology, lab, and pharmacy. Um, for, and then a big thank you to our IT team. We would not have been able to accomplish this go live without the leadership, the buy-in and the participation from our IT team. They were with us every step of the way. They're the ones that really made this a reality because they've been able to create a system that is, again, like I said, it's, very, it's interoperable, it's one-stop shopping, it's easy to use. Um, and so without IT support, it becomes such a bigger lift. Um, so again, I can't thank them enough. And we continue to work together, tweaking and improving uh, the processes and the structure on a daily basis. So that kind of collaboration is key. Next slide. So a little bit, just real quick, I know we're running out of time, um, a little bit about our model. We identify patients both in the emergency room and uh, that have already been admitted to the um, inpatient units. And we they meet a set of criteria that we've established. It's about 14 pages long. <laughs> um, but we've built some decision support in Epic to help try and um, filter some of those patients that meet criteria for us to then review. We um, use the EPIC uh, EMR for that, as well as we've integrated Current Health into EPIC. So that's kind of our integrated technology suite. With that, we perform um, at-home visits. So there are at minimum two registered nurse at-home visits daily and one physician visit either virtually or in person, okay? Um, the, the patients use the current health platform to communicate with us real time um, and, and that vice versa. And then we have our command center. Our command center is manned by a 24 seven registered nurse. It is on site, it's down the hall from where I'm sitting. Um, it, it is decked out in current health. So, um, it, you know, it, it's really, we have a big screen on the wall that has all of our biometric information. It's getting real time information from our patients. It's just terrific to see. And then of course at the core is our patients. So whenever everything about this program is patient centric, we are bringing everything to the patient rather than taking the patient and bringing them everywhere else. So it's really fantastic to see. And then we, we discharge and we discharge to either home or with home care services. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I do wanna just touch on staffing before I forget. So. Really important here, patient experience is, is paramount. Um, I'm sure it is for all of your organizations as well. I, these are patient experience results from our current health survey. There is not a group of patients that are more satisfied with their care at NYU than the home hospital patients. They are thrilled. This is patient number four. Louise, in her home, she had COVID pneumonia 
Um, uh, this is one of our nurses um, taking care of her. She did terrific. She used the current health platform, no problem. And just to read a couple of comments that I thought were just terrific. Um, this is an outstanding program. I actually got sad knowing I was being discharged. It's very hard to improve on a masterpiece like fine wine. I mean, we don't see that on HCAP surveys ever, <laughs> yeah. ever. So, you know, it, it's just so refreshing to see. And, and, and I would be remiss, we're talking about patient experience, but I do want to talk really quickly. We have one more minute about staff engagement. The staff enga engagement is through the roof. We have nurses that were exhausted, burnt out, they were tired of their um, routine in the acute care setting. We've given them an opportunity to take their knowledge and shift to a different care delivery model, and they are just loving it. I the the, the engagement is just exceptional. So um, you know I can't say enough about it. So we're really proud of the work we've done and. And we're hoping to scale even more. Like the slide says, we have a capacity right now of four. We're going up to eight um, in the next couple of months. So uh, more to come. That's so exciting. Thank you, Eve. I'm going to rapid fire through some of these questions. Um, Danielle asked, which executive do you see hospital at home falling under um, ultimately for the like CEO. that primary membership? The CEO. Well, executive buy-in it has to be at the at CEO level, sure. But who's like the is that who has kind of the ultimate ownership over the program, like at that level of the organization? Yeah. I mean, I'm the vice president who operationalizes it, but without his buy-in, it wouldn't have happened. And you report to the CEO. I do. Okay, awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. Joe, I believe we answered your question about the um, current daily scale um, and that patient census. Um, Gary asked, uh, was respiratory therapy included in the development of the program? I feel like we had that one on there. They were, they uh, were in there, right? at the table. So yes, respiratory therapy was included. Um, I will tell you that most of the respiratory treatments are provided by registered nurses. However, we do have respiratory therapists that can make visits in the home and often consult virtually. Awesome. And then our final question here is from Sherry Dorfman, who I love, went to the trouble to say no relation. <laughs> she typed this question out. Her question is, um, how are you involving the family caregivers into your program who are supporting patients at home between those nurse and physician visits? Do family caregivers have access to the current health app for communication with the care team, education, et cetera? It's a great question. So we, the screening that we do is quite extensive um, initially and includes family buying, right? So if you're completely independent, um, which most patients are not when they're acutely ill, but if you are uh, independent, that's another story, but most patients need some kind of support when they're in the home. Um, certainly if you need full complete support, this may not be the program for you. Um, but we do include, um, so there's a couple of things. First of all, every patient has to have a completed healthcare proxy. If they do not, they don't qualify. Um, they, uh, we have to have an emergency contact number that's, that is answered every time. If we don't, then you don't qualify for this program, okay? Um, third of all, we do extensive education with the patients and their families before we transfer them home. And that, and once they arrive home, about how to use the technology, what to use when. Um, and, and so, um, yes, we teach the family members who will be in the home to leverage the technology in the home. We don't, we are not at the point where we've recommended them downloading an app and using it externally. We have not done that. Um, but it's certainly if they're in the home, they can leverage the, the technology. Right. Sure. They could interact with the current health app and initiate a call with the provider or do something like that. Right. Just, right. just by being there. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Okay. Awesome. That is, oh, they keep coming in. Let's see. We're going to take, um, how do you see the growing movement of direct to employer impacting the expansion of hospital at home? Ooh, Chuck, you come in with a hard hitter. 
providers moving to full risk models away from value-based care schemes, allowing decisions based on best care models? Chuck, this is a great question, but I think we're going to have to we're going to have to put a pin in it and come back to it at another time. What a great um, what a great topic for a follow up conversation. Um, I think that is going to uh, be all that we have time for today. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our awesome um, engaged audience here. As I said, please keep a lookout um, in your email for the deck as well as recording of this session. Um, and we're going to go ahead and send you that um, survey report that we talked about at the at the top of this as well. Um, and you will be asked to give us a little bit of feedback about um, how you felt about this webinar on your way out the door. So thank you all so much. Be well. Happy holidays. and. Uh, We'll see you next time. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, 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 Thanks,